If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Genesis chapter 12? We'll be reading in a few moments from verse 1. We'll read the first eight verses of Genesis chapter 12. Well, I just want to, to, to take a few moments, if I can, here at the beginning. I like to do this at the beginning of the year and just really talk about uh, who Stone Creek Church is. And, and, and how many know this is that you can have the same two parents and they can give birth to multiple children and every child is completely different. I've heard someone say this, if I had my second child as my first child, there would have been no second child. <laughs> I'm not saying that was me. I'm just saying I heard somebody. And the truth is, same DNA, but just different expression. We have the same God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. However, churches are uniquely different, as they should be, and that's okay, and that's good. And we wanted, I just want to, if with a diagram, explain to you just kind of our philosophy of how we do things here at Stone Creek Church, because I know this is a time of the year when we have many people uh, maybe as a new habit or attending church or coming back, and just, it's just good to know who we are. We have a diagram, and what we say is, at Stone Creek Church, one is at the heart of everything that we do. And so we have a vertical arrow, and that says we are centered on the one as individuals and also collectively as a whole corporately. We want to center around the activity of God, around the presence of God. We are purpose-driven, but we are also presence-based. We believe the presence of God is what makes the difference. In 1 Corinthians 14, describing the Corinthian church, it says that God was in their midst. And I think that's the best compliment you can give any church is that God's presence was there at work. I don't care if you remember my name. I don't care if you remember who the worship leader is. I don't care if you remember the name of church. You could be like, that stone church, something I don't even know. But you could say, all I know is, is that I got saved there and the presence of God is there. That's the best thing you could ever say about a church. So we want to be centered on the one. Also, when we center on the one, it'll impact our earthly relationships. So the arrow down is we embrace biblical oneness. We believe that inherent in the gospel is this oneness that comes, a unity that we now have. We have been baptized into Christ. There's either male nor female, Jew, Gentile, a slave nor free. This unity that we have, it transcends classism, sexism, racism. We have a responsibility. It's a supernatural work to protect it with our speech and our actions. So we talk about protecting, embracing it through our actions, protecting it, and also to be intentional about it. How many know we can have a oneness in Christ and still be an all-white church? We can have a oneness in Christ and still be an all-black church. We can have a oneness in Christ and be an all-Korean church. But we believe one of the greatest expressions of the power of the gospel is it begins to cross social barriers. And it begins to, and one of the greatest ones that it crosses is racial reconciliation. So, what we do here at Stone Creek, we are intentional about talking about that and developing cross-cultural, multi-ethnic relationships. Amen? Amen? So we embrace biblical oneness. And then horizontally, what we talk about, both arrows, is we want to pursue the one. We preach a lot of times ex expositionally. We are a word church. We go right through the word. We, we love the Bible. We have a high view of scripture. It is infallible. It is inspired. We believe it is the word and the authoritative and rule of all godliness. We believe that. We study it. However, we also, not only do we want to go deep in God, we also want to make sure that we always keep the one who's not here in mind. Jesus said, I'll leave the 99 and go after the one. We want to have a pursue the one mentality. We do that by giving and by going. You know one of the ways that you are evangelistic and you share the gospels through generosity of your resources. And we say that takes management or stewarding your resources differently. I live on less so that I can give to God's work. There are things that I can't do that I want to do and that I, I can't quite go do because I've made so much of a commitment to fund God's work. How many know the gospel's free, but the mode to get it there often isn't? How does that happen? Through the generosity of God's people. Next is we go. That's a prioritizing thing. That's a time thing. Is I make time to serve God by serving others. I reorient my schedule so that I can serve in a local church, that I can serve in the community, that I can go on a trip, a global trip, and share the gospel in another country. I reprioritize my time because there's only two things that last forever, the word of God and the eternal soul. And I make those things a priority. We're very big. You will always be challenged 
in your stewardship, in your money, and also with the way that you steward your time. We will always talk about that unapologetically. So here's what I know back up to the top vertical arrow, is that the way that we do this individually is the way that we do it corporately. We are centering on prayer, 21 days of prayer and fasting, I'm called the church. If this is your home, there is a high expectation for you to be there. The four Wednesdays in January, we are set aside those to pray, to seek the Lord, asking you to make that a priority. This uh, Wednesday, we had almost between 280 and 290 adults and 60 kids throughout the day. This place was jam-packed. Somebody said, I thought it was a Sunday morning. <laughs> it, was just all, uh, it was just packed. We had 230-something people here on Wednesday night praying about 40 or 50 so in the noon prayer meeting and in the, in the morning prayer meeting. Listen, when a church does that, watch out because God's on the move and God will be at work. And so thank you. And again, this Wednesday, I'd love to see you there. We're also reading collectively through the scriptures in a one-year Bible reading plan. You can download that on the app. You can pick up a hard copy at the connection table and you can follow along with us. If you haven't done it, just jump right in and start reading the scriptures uh, with us. Now, here's why this is so important. Because as we do this, as you abide through prayer and saturate in the word, get ready to listen because God's going to speak. You cannot be in a place of prayer and submitted and saturated your life in the word and God not speak to you and challenge your heart. So you abide, you saturate, you listen. And then when God speaks... You obey. And so the word of God, when it comes to you, there's it, it an expectation that you obey whatever the promptings of God are. And so today, what we're going to do, we're going to look at a man by the name of Abram, who would later become Abraham. He is considered the father of the faith. We're going to begin to read here in a few moments the first of seven conversations that God has with him. And throughout uh, January, I'm just going to be preaching just to highlight our Bible reading plan on some of the, uh, the chapters that we read during the week. So this is a chapter that we read this week, Genesis chapter 12. Here's what you have to understand. The first 11 chapters of Genesis outside of the creation narrative are largely a failure. I mean, by the end of chapter two, beginning of chapter three, Adam and Eve have already blown it. They've already sinned. And you would have too. Don't even try to play it off. Don't blame them. You would have done it too. We would have put your name in there and be blaming you for all eternity too. <laughs> Adam and Eve. And then you have shortly after that, you have... The first murder, Cain kills his brother Abel. After that, you have all kinds of incestuous behavior. You have all kinds of, 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 of wars and rumors of war, all kinds of things that are happening. By chapter 6, 7, God's destroyed the whole thing. He said, I'm done. I'm scrapping it. We're moving on. I'm going to try a different approach. And then uh, what happens is, and the Tower of Babel comes in 11, 10 and 11. And, and now what you see in Genesis 12, get this is a new beginning where God is going to reveal through an individual, his family, and ultimately through his nation, his plan to save the world. It's, it's the long game that God is playing in Genesis chapter 12. What I want to look at is I want to look at Abram and his life as an example of, of, of how we're to walk in obedience, things that we can learn to live this journey of faith and apply it in 2020 and beyond. But the story of Abram doesn't start out good. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 2, we're going to put this on the screen. It, it reads as follows. It says that Joshua said to all the people, this is a later leader talking about Abraham. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Long ago your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worshipped other gods. So when the scriptures introduce Abraham to us, guess what? The father of the faith was an idolater. He was not worshipping God. He was not looking for God. But that did not matter because God came looking for him. How many of you, that would be your story. You really weren't really looking for God, but God came looking for you. And he found you. And when we find Abram, uh, he doesn't, Abraham, he doesn't start with much. And I just want to be just really, when we, we sometimes we, we put these people on a pedestal. But when Abraham comes, the father of the faith, here's what happens. Here's what we have to keep in mind is that he is an idolater. We find out in the scriptures that he has a proclivity towards lying. We find out that he is not the first son. So in the biblical times, he has no secured future. He has no inheritance. And, and, and he's the second or third son. And, and there's no way that he can get that kind of a blessing. So his future is uncertain. He has no child. 
So the scripture says that he's 75 years old. Come on, somebody. (laughs) All of these barriers at play that you would say in the natural eye, God can't do much there. But I believe this this week as I was praying why I chose this text, I believe God prompted my heart. And I just have a word for somebody in this place. We would call this in biblical terms a prophetic word. And, And maybe you're watching or maybe you're in this room today. Here's the word of the Lord. There is no barrier that you can come up with and place before him that can prevent him from working through you if you are willing to obey him. There was no barrier that you can put before him that will prevent him from working through you as long as you are willing to obey him. And so you're going to read the story about how God uses an unlikely character to do an incredibly great work, and it's found in Genesis chapter 12, and it's the story of a new beginning. Let's read it. It says, the Lord had said to Abram, uh, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I'm going to show you. I'll make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarah, his nephew, Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and put his tent with Bethel on his west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and he called on the name of the Lord. So we are going to learn from Abram's example on how to live this thing called the the walk of faith. He's never told where, he's never told when, he's never told how, and he's never told why, but he sets off on a faith journey, and God does amazing things in and through his life. So here's a few things that as God begins to speak and God begins to direct us, and some of these will be reminding, some of these will be uh, kind of things for the first time to help you govern the will of God as you do it. And the first one is this, is that security. Security is not what determines God's will. Security is no indicator to you that it's the will of God. Rarely in Scripture, in fact, I would say never in the Bible does God give anyone an easy job. In fact, I would say often the righteous thing, ultimately the right thing, is rarely the easy thing. And you're going to see through the Scriptures this uh, uh, to be true. And let's just go back a few characters, or ahead a few characters. Jonah, God says to him, arise and go to Nineveh. Now, this may seem like an easy thing to you, but the Ninevites were Assyrians. They had a huge barbarian-like history. They would annihilate any culture or community. They would murder huge, in genocide fashion, huge factions of people. Most certainly, and they had killed some of Jonah's relatives. And God says, hey, you know, this whole gospel thing, why don't you, hey, in fact, why don't you go to Nineveh? Go there and proclaim my word. And Jonah says, "Mm, not happening. (laughs) And so now there should have only been two chapters in Jonah. Jonah 1, he hears. Jonah 2, he obeys. But there's two extra chapters in that book. Now, how many of you have a few extra chapters in your life? (laughs) Moses. Moses grows up in privilege. He grows up in Pharaoh's house. He has lots of privilege and education. And it says that he tries to save his people by murdering a man and lives a, and then flees for his life as a political refugee. But then God says these words to him. Uh, Moses, after about 40 years of wandering, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back to Egypt, and I want you to tell that Pharaoh guy, just tell him, let all my people go. Yep. That is not going to be an easy thing. In fact, let me just say it like this. Do you know the word easy? only appears in the Bible one time. It only appears in there one place. Anybody know where it is? Come to me, 
all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What's it say? For my yoke is and my burden is light. You know, Kanye West didn't invent Yeezys. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> when I read the Bible, that's the first thing I thought of, man. Yoke, easy, Yeezy. Come on, somebody. Well, there you go. I think I'm pretty funny today for some reason. I don't know why. God never, God's will is rarely easy, but he does say in the midst of difficulty, here's what the promise is. You can have an easy soul. Your soul can be at ease. It can have confidence. It can be at rest. It can be filled with peace. And ultimately, it can be lighthearted in the midst of difficult circumstances. That's the kind of easy that the Bible talks about. But there are three things they say that give us security in life. Our family, our friends, and our nation. Here's the reality. God says, leave them all, Abraham, in my will. Leave your father's household. Leave your people. And also, leave your nation, your country. I, don't, I want to camp out here because I don't want to minimize what some of our brothers and sisters in Christ have to deal with when they leave the Muslim faith. What did they give up to serve Christ? They give up their family. They give up their friends. And they have to give up their nation. I think we should not minimize that in any way, shape, or form. They do so because they are now citizens of another country. They have another people group. They have brothers and sisters in Christ. And they are a part of this thing, the family of God called the church. But I think in a, sometimes in the United States, we can dangerously usurp our relationship with God by putting any of those three above him. Sometimes our relationship with God can go off kilter when we begin to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the will of God as long as it doesn't disrupt what my mom or my dad or my family want. And I can put them over that. I remember I had a very nice conversation with my mother-in-law when I first got married. We have since not had this conversation, so I probably don't know if I did a good job or a bad job, but I remember we were talking about being missionaries at one point, Christian workers, and she says to me, you can't do that because I'm not going to live away from my grandkids, and I just said, I just want you to know, and I'm going to say this as kindly as possible, you will never be consulted when it comes to the will of God for our family. Amen. You can give input, but you will not be the one that gets to determine. How many know we didn't have many conversations about that after then? <laughs> And I'm just saying, you can't make pleasing them over God. Also, you can't be afraid of offending or disappointing people, your friends or cultural groups, and obeying the will of the Lord. When you try to culturally please everyone and not the God, Christianity gets weird and it goes off kilter. But here's the one I think we struggle with the most in the United States, is we often will put our nationalistic tendencies over our relationship with God. And I'm just going to say a few things on record and then so you can just hear me. And maybe you didn't know this, but now you will. God is not, get this, an American. <laughs> I'll just say that. That also means that God is not a Democrat. <laughs> and it also means, despite popular opinion, that God is not a Republican. It also means that. A little less clapping on that one, though, I notice, huh? <laughs> Just be careful. Just be really careful. Because you will create a version of Christianity that looks very different from the one in the Bible. Moving on before I get too quiet in here. Obedience, verse 2. Here's some things that you can expect as you obey. You see in the life of Abraham. Verse 2. He says, go to the land I will show you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. This is, as we see them together, um, go to the place I will show you. What you can expect as you obey is God to reveal his will to you more fully and clearly. And God never shares his will with the curious but he shares it with the obedient. And once you set your heart defaults to yes, God, you don't have to share the who, the what, when, where, why, and how God I will obey, then the will of God, he reveals it to you. 
But if you say, God, show me, can I peek around a corner a little bit and then I'll decide? How many know that doesn't work? <laughs> and when, let me just say this too. When it comes to reading your Bible, as you're reading through in a year, don't worry about the parts that you don't understand. Just keep reading. The things I'm concerned about are the parts that you do understand. Obey those. Where the Bible is, come on, where the Bible is clear and you know what's clear, then is your heart in alignment with that and is your actions in alignment with that? If you sow, then God will reveal more to you. The next one is transformation. I will make your name great. Now, I've alluded to this. Abraham was a liar. He was a lot of things, and he didn't seem to have great character. But what you're going to see is God begin to develop integrity in his life and in his heart as he learns the ways of God through prayer and through interacting with him. God, when, when God begins to, when we begin to walk in obedience, he will reveal more to you. But here's the beautiful thing. He transforms your character. That's the beautiful thing is you walk in obedience. Not only will you do things for you, he'll do things to you. And here's the beautiful thing about it. He'll do things through you, which is coming next. You will be a blessing to others. So what God does for you, ultimately, he will do things in, to you. And then he wants to do things through you. You can expect that cycle to take place as your obedience leads to those three things. Now, next is this. Remember, as you walk in obedience, your obedience is always bigger than you. Verse 3 he says that all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Your current obedience is not only to bless you, but it's to bless future generations. Your, the blessings on you are going to fall upon your children. Your obedience is not just impacting your children, but guess what? It's impacting your children's children, grandchildren. You are sitting in a room that you gave no money to. You are sitting in pews that you didn't sacrifice for. You are sitting in the blessing on someone else's life. You are reaping the benefits of somebody else's blessing. And you know 10, 20, 30 years from now, who knows what these buildings will look like? Who knows what will happen? But people will be experiencing the presence of God long after some of us are gone because of the blessings of God on your life. It's awesome. It's bigger than just you. And the reason that God blesses you is so that you can in turn bless others who have yet to be blessed in the ways that you're blessed. He says, I will bless you so that you can be a blessing to the nations of the world. You know, let's always keep in mind that the world still matters. You know, you may be inclined to have a political persuasion that says, let's just go bomb all the Iranians. Let's just blow them off the map. But you have to understand that probably the greatest move of God in the entire world and the church right now, an incredible revival move of God by the thousands, the tens of thousands are being saved. The church is growing in the midst of Iran like never before. So you have to understand that the world matters and the nations of the world matter to God. And we have a responsibility with our resources, with our prayers and all that we are to bless the nations of the world. Because right here, Galatians says, referring to this verse, this is the, one of the first references to the gospels. Because this is what the angels refer to when the shepherds show up. And the angel says, behold, this is going to be good news to all the peoples. This is the beautiful thing about the gospel that God from the very beginning has a multi-ethnic church in mind that they all the peoples of the world this is not a white thing a black thing an asian thing this is a god thing and it's supposed to go to all the peoples of the world all right so that means this when you get a promotion let's see if you clap on this one when you get a promotion your first question cannot be what am i going to buy with this my new car, what addition, what new home am I going to buy for a vacation home? How am I going to fund my 401k? Here it is. Ready? When you get promotion and more resources, the first question for you and me is this. God, who do you want me to bless with this now? <laughs> Obedience. Here's the next one. Learning from Abram. Obedience is better than resources. It says, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. I've already alluded to this, but Abram leaves with hardly anything. And by the end of his life, you're going to see that he was as wealthier than any nation 
that he had great resources. He was the envy. No one blessed any, no one was more blessed than Abram. Large resources, territory. God had expanded his tent more than any other person in that day. But it didn't start out that day. He went. Can I just say, when it comes to this, you don't need much to start with, but when you step out in faith, what you do need is a word from the Lord. You need some scripture that God has imprinted on your heart by the power and the witness of the Holy Spirit that you claim is your home, that you hold on to in difficult circumstances. The scripture says that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ or the word of the Lord. When you hear the word of God, and, and, and faith is based on the word of God, but it leads to obedience, it leads to action. God could not bless them the way he wanted to bless them amongst that people, amongst his family's household. He had to get them to the place that he wanted them to be, the appointed place, so that he could bless them like he wanted to bless them, but they had to leave with nothing but a word from the Lord. So many times we want all the resources and everything that we need before we start, but what we need more than anything is a word of God that will put faith in our heart. Because the word of the Lord has the ability to keep us. It was David who prays in difficult circumstances in Psalms 119. God, remember thy word. Remember the word that you gave to your servant. Remember thy word to me. And I just, I was interviewing some, some uh, church planters. And they were fully funded. They had all the resources. They wanted to plant a church in our community here in Champaign or Bannon. I said, how did you pick it? Well, we just looked at some places that seemed like the best one. I said, great. Did, the, did God give you any words? Has God given you a word? What he wants to do in and through you? And they couldn't answer the question because here's the reality. Money can dry up. People may not come in the way that you think they're going to come. There can be delays. There can be issues. There can be circumstances. But what will keep you when great difficulty comes, is that you have a word. Abram, 75 years old, 100 year old, no kid. He was 100 years old when he would have his first son, Isaac. He could pray for 25 years. Lord, you said you would make of me a great nation. You said you would bless me in this way. Even though it hasn't happened, I hold you accountable for the word. Great promises build great leaders. Great promises, they build great leaders. When I came to um, Bible college to fulfill the call of God on my life. I was 18 years old. I left with a suitcase and a bunch of trash bags and a baseball bat my dad had given me for my birthday. That's all I had in my car. I took my Mercury Tracer, come on somebody, all the way up. I was the last one, no doubt. They didn't think I was coming. I was the last one to arrive that day. And I showed up there, unpacked, which means I ripped the garbage bags open and dumped them on the floor. All that good stuff. I, I spent five years there, and uh, my wife, who's sitting right here, she did it in three. It took me five. I mean, some people just take a little longer, right? Just take a little. No judgment here, and at least not by me. So it took five years, and I remember I was the, I was the graduating speaker, and I, God had blessed me, touched my life. It was awesome, largely debt-free. I'm two weeks out. I have nowhere to go. I don't know what I'm going to do, and I get a phone call from Pastor Gary Grogan, my predecessor, and Terry Ostra, who was a pastor on staff here. And he's, he, Gary Grogan, hey, bro, if you know that's his voice. Uh, <laughs> bro, here's a role I have for you. What'd you think about coming? By the way, I can't hardly pay you anything, and, uh, but I'd really love for you to come. And so I prayed about it, and guess what? I felt like God gave me a word, a promise from Scripture, so I came. I came in 2003 for $600 a month, insurance paid, and a couch to sleep on in 2003. Now, I'm pleased to say I make a little bit more than $600 now. <laughs> and, but I came. But here's, the, here's what I'm going to share with you. I was here, I've been here 17 years, and when we started talking transition, it took years to come to the decision that God was calling us to stay. I had people counsel me, good meaning people say, leave. Don't stay here and follow a long-tenured leader because you'll be the fall guy. And the person after you will get the success. Wait for somebody else to fail, and then you come in and be the hero later on because the culture is too strong. And I remember wrestling with that. I'm thinking, man, I don't know, but Lord, why would you want that to happen? Why would you want those things? 
And I remember where I was. I was in my hometown of Madison, Indiana. I was in that church's parking lot. I had pulled the car in the parking lot to read my Bible, my yearly Bible reading plan, and I read Leviticus 26. And it was as if the words jump out on the page to me, and it said something like this. It said that I will cause the rain to come upon your land in season. And it says that I will cause the ground to yield its harvest. I will make the trees fruitful. I will make sure that you dwell together in harmony and peace. I will remove the savage beast from your midst. You will defeat all of your enemies. And it says that I will cause my face to look upon you. I will increase you in number. I will cause, last, you will be eating last year's grain. And, have, and then when the new grain comes in and have to make room for the new. And it says, I will be your God and tabernacle amongst you and walk among you and your people. You will walk with your head held high because I have removed from you the bars of Egypt from upon you. And I felt like the Lord says, if you will stay, this is what I will do. So you know what I do every Sunday morning when it's dark and all of you are still in bed about five something in the morning. I will literally walk. I did it this morning and I put, turn the Bible to Leviticus 26 and I say, Lord, remember thy word to thy servant. And I quote it. So obedience is better than great resources. God will add everything to you if you step in faith. You don't need a lot to start with. You just need a word from the Lord that puts faith in your heart by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The last two things really quick is this. Be careful who travels with you. Be careful who travels with you. Verse 5, it says, this is good. He took his wife, Sarah. How many know it's good to take your spouse with you? Amen. He took his wife, Sarah, and he also, here it is, his nephew, Lot. Lot's father had died, and Abraham had adopted him. And Lot would become his greatest source of trouble. Lot's character was not righteous. It was devious. And he would get himself in some precarious situations. Abraham twice had to send an army to rescue him. Once through his prayers, redeems him from a very difficult circumstance, from the judgment of God. And they grew, as God blessed Abraham, he blessed Lot. There, there are two nations or two households were at war with one another and competing in frustration. So they separate. He takes half of what was Abraham's. And so it, it just doesn't start and end very well between him and Lot. But here's the principle. Eventually they part ways, and this is good. Keep this in mind as you walk with the Lord. Not everyone who starts with you will get to finish with you. Not everyone who starts with you. Sometimes the blessings of God are subtraction, not addition. And sometimes the greatest way at first that God's blessing you is he's removing people from your life. So not everyone who starts with you will ultimately get to finish with you. That may mean you have to have some hard conversations. But keep this in mind when you have to deal with these. And this is why I got this from a wizened old pastor. And that is this. You can't manage your way out of spiritual situations. But, and you can't spiritualize your way out of management issues. You can't manage your way out of spiritual issues. And you can't spiritualize your way out of management issues. No amount of praying and fasting is going to get you out of debt. It can pray and help the blessing of God, but you've got to do two things. You've got to B-O-B and J-O-B. <laughs> you've got to start balling on a budget. Come on, you've got to manage it. Live on less, manage your resources, and you got a J-O-B, and no, that's not Job in the Bible. That's job. <laughs> you got to get one of those. you got to work to the best of your ability. you got to manage your way out. It's a management issue. However, you cannot manage your way out of a spiritual issue. Okay? You cannot manage your way into the kingdom of heaven. You cannot self-help your way out of demonic activity. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to deliver you, to save you, and to set you free and to transform your wicked heart. That's what you need. You can't manage your way out of that. Not everyone who starts with you can finish with you. And then lastly is this, as I close, build altars as you go. It says twice in the text that we just read that Abram, so he built an altar there to the Lord. And if you haven't listened to that series, I would encourage you to go to our website and download it. We spent almost 10 weeks talking about the altered life. And before you alter with an E, you got to learn to alter with an A. And what that means is the altar biblically is the place of divine exchange. It's where uh, people commune with God. It's where they would worship. What were they? They were these monuments that they would build out of stone, out of brick, out of wood, um, sometimes out of bone and glass. And they would build these makeshift monuments. And there they would sacrifice the offerings. And there they would commune with God and worship and call upon his name. There are no such places for the Christian in the New Testament. However, it is called the place of prayer. That is the altar. And here's the reality of this. 
Every season of your life will require you to make new sacrifice and surrender. It will call you back to the altar. What precedes the blessings of God in the, in the new season will always be this. We must come back to the place of divine exchange. We must come back to the place of prayer and submit to the authority of his word and build the altar again and say, God, I submit my heart again to you. I worship you again. God, I want what you want, not what I want. God, I reorient my life around the altar of the Lord. And as you do that, God begins to speak and direct and lead your life. And listen, we will never outgrow our need for the altar. We cannot succeed our way to the point where we say we've got this in our cleverness and our ability and our resources. We cannot leave the place of the altar. Just because we reach a certain age and certain time with the Lord, 75, 100 years old. Come on, somebody, if you're still kicking it at 100. Here's the reality. You still need the altar. You still need the place of prayer. And as we close, here's this thought. I don't make doctrines and theologies about what I'm about to share with you, but I believe there is a prophetic word here for you. And this is something that I think is important to see in the scripture. And this may be the word of the Lord for you. But it says that he went from the east to the west. He put his tent near Bethel. He starts out near Ai and he moves. Ai means this. It means in the Hebrew, the city of ruins. And Bethel means the house of God. So what happens is, watch this. He begins a journey in the city of ruins. He has nothing. He's an idolater. He is um, a liar. He has no inheritance. He has no son. He's older. And it says he starts. And then he sends this journey. And he leaves the city of ruins. And then he moves towards the place where God dwells, the house of the Lord. East to west, the sun rises in the east, sets in the west, so he's following the light. Here's the reality. As you read God's word and you put yourself in the place of prayer, God's word is a light unto your feet. And as you follow the light and God makes you aware and you walk in obedience, you're leaving the city of ruins and you are moving towards Bethel, a place where God dwells, the house of the Lord. The scripture says in Proverbs 4.23 that to the righteous the will of God is like the first gleam of, of dawn but growing ever brighter to the full light of the noonday sun. So as God begins it reveals his will to you and you begin this journey, I believe 2020, I don't know what 2019 was like, but you can look back and say it's a city of ruins. Leave it behind and begin to move towards the house of the Lord as he reveals his will to you. How many can say amen to that?